Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and our Thursday shows throughout September have all focused on the performing arts. And today, we're wrapping up the month by looking at the work of performing arts presenters and how they go about choosing what makes it onto their stage with special guest, Terry Dwyer, Executive Director of the Clarice Performing Arts Center, the University of Maryland, Joan Squires, President of the Omaha Performing Arts, and Alan Vela, President and CEO of the Fox Theater in Atlanta. So we have Maryland, we have Nebraska, we have Georgia, we have the world here, right? <laughs> At least North America. <laughs> and it's just it's just great to, to be talking about this because the performing arts are facing huge, huge challenges. And they're ha- facing challenges with the, the audiences, the tastes, the artists, you are actually at the forefront of not only serving people you've always served, but also transforming your organizations to serve more people and evolve the art form. So, uh, Terry, let's start with you. You you've been around in different in different environments. You've served a lot of different audiences. You've you've worked in different states. Um, just to set you up, there are thirty two thousand performing arts organizations in America, um, employing over a quarter of a million people and earning more than $12 billion in revenue, plus adding to the local economy. And you've, you've been in, in, in Southern California, you're now in Maryland. Could you talk about, in, in your career arc, how did you come into the field? What, did you, what was the sensibility surrounding the performing arts and performing arts audiences when you first came into the field? And how have you seen it evolve through your career? Well, thank you, Mark. I, you know, when I started, I was in uh, producing theaters and I tended to be at institutions that produced a lot of new work and very adventurous work. And what we did is we produced the best work we could. And then we tried to convince audiences to go on that adventurous ride with us. So it was a kind of a singular approach. And, and that kind of thing is, has an important role in, in the field. But it, um, I think the times have changed. Almost every since my earlier days in um, producing theater, the institutions I've been at have been evolving and that process has rapidly accelerated uh, during the pandemic and post pandemic. I think what what we've done in in the institutions I've I've been at is we've redefined what we view our audiences are as anybody that participates in any program anywhere. So that's in our venues or off campus. And what that has done is it has caused us to redefine our programming scheme in in not just a wide range of artistic programs, but also uh, Three other for us, three other areas of programming: um, civic uh, citizenship and social society, um, cultural activism, and digital clarice. In addition to artistic programming, and we use all of those to reach our entire audience, which is everybody in our community. So I would, you know, there was one um, one comment about uh, how do you maximize income in this changing times? But we really look at how do we we want to maximize income, but we also want to maximize institutional relevance. So we, with great intention, we pursue all these programming schemes to reach all of our audiences to try to, and what we're finding is it does maximize income, but much more growth in contributed income than an earned income. So we it's a different kind of balance to strike for us. So it, that, that's interesting. So basically you're getting at your mission by looking at the issue of relevance and your your operating theory is that if you're relevant to every different group with all these different tastes, with all these different purposes, with all these different thirsts for different types of experiences, if you're relevant, the revenue will follow, the support will follow, right? I mean, that's that's the whole game uh, ball of wax for you, isn't it, Terry? It is, and we're not allowing ourselves to be branded as a singular cultural institution. We we think we're a cultural, an educational, and a a civic resource for the community. So it's a much broader brand, and there's a lot of lot much uh, greater number, a much greater number of ways to value us. And it's, uh, you know, it goes to we've all been brought up wanting to pursue artistic excellence in all that we do, at least at points in our career. And what we've done is. We want excellence, but we're sharing the definition of that with people that we're trying to reach. So we build relationships out in the community and we say, what's important to you? What's excellent for your community or what's relevant for your community? And we try to respond to that in addition to what, however, we might define that. And Joan, how are you seeing the same the same question? Because you are serving a a, uh, an entire state. In fact, 
I would argue that you're serving an entire region of the country. It's a very, very important temple. You have a lot of different audiences to serve. We do. And because of the nature of our venues, we're able to, to really serve a wide variety of art forms. Um, when we first um, started the organization almost 20 years ago, um, we looked at what the community needs were at the time. Um, so what was missing, we we're the only major presenter um, in this region, in this, um, especially in Omaha. And what were the opportunities? Since that time, we have continued to grow, and I think as Terry has said, to reach a broad array of audiences, both within our buildings and externally. Sometimes I think in our industry, we talk about the difference between nonprofit and commercial, and those lines are really blurred at this point. It's about the quality of what we're doing, and it's connecting to community. Um, we've got uh, a traditional uh, proscenium theater with our Orpheum. We've got a concert hall with the Holland Center. And actually, the rendering behind me is Steelhouse Omaha, which is our newest venue, which is um, for audiences that will stand and watch some of the touring bands that are coming across the country uh, with a capacity of 3,000. So we have really uh, striven to present artists of quality, but a wide variety of genres. And I think particularly to connect to community. So how can we also use those artists that may not be as well known to make sure that we're connecting to community, both within our buildings and, and externally, as, as, as Terry referenced? Um, and it's facilities as a strategic asset for the artists to present the work in a way that for them has resonance, has meaning, is appropriate. So you're you're building out your venues so that you not only can connect to to audiences, but you're providing the uh, the artist with the venue that is appropriate for their particular form. Exactly. And it's really the artist and the audience. So it's the, the types of facilities and venues that they are comfortable. Um, we do do a lot beyond our venues, though, too. So in addition to uh, the structures that we have, um, it's the connection to community. So we do take performances uh, and make sure we're developing meaningful engagement and education activities um, for the, frankly, the entire state. We have programs that go all the way across Nebraska. And Alan, you have a totally different challenge. You have a historic movie house that has this amazing history. And it, it was it was just, thank goodness, it was preserved. Talk a little bit about the Fox Theater and how you program the Fox Theater and how you consider your relationship with the audience. Well, yeah, thank you, Mark. We're, we're a little different. Um, so we're a, a, a theater that was built in 1929 uh, by the Shriners here in Atlanta. And then later, William Fox became a primary tenant. Um, and the Fox was uh, almost demolished in, in the 1970s. So we were our nonprofit. Was I remember, out. by the way, Alan, I remember. Do, do you all remember that 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 whole news um, uh, cycle in, in the 70s where this was happening? Because it was a big deal. There were there was a huge movement in Atlanta. It was it was really fascinating. I remember that. There's quite a few facilities that were being torn down all around Atlanta and, and many, many historic properties that were really gems, including other theaters. And I think the community finally uh, put their put their fist down and said, listen, not the Fox and the Save the Fox campaign was born. So our theater was born out of the notion of preservation. So um, our mission is to preserve and to share. And then, as you know, we're a very large venue. We're 4,665 seats. So the way I the way I interpret our building is obviously we're a popular entertainment venue. Can't really do esoteric types of programming in, in a seat, you know, in a facility this large. It's it's like eating a gourmet meal in a in an airplane hangar. Right. It doesn't feel so good if you're uh, dining in a big space like that. You want to be in a cozy booth. So you want to right size that artist um, to the facility. And in our case, um, we're competing with quite a few facilities, beautiful facilities like the Woodruff Arts Center, the Cobb Energy Center, uh, Chastain, and many, many others. Um, so uh, we believe that we should have a wide array of audiences come through our building. So we'll present dance and film and contemporary music and hip hop and comedy. And we're competing, as, as Joan said, the lines are blurred. We're competing with all the for-profits so I always say we have the heart of a nonprofit, but we 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 have the entrepreneurial spirit of a for profit. Um, so you have to take a look at the at the physical facility and what that's suited for. And if you're going to connect to these different audiences, you have to think about the scale of your venue 
right? And how, uh, what you present on stage that connects to those different audiences. So you're all talking in, in very interesting terms about a portfolio of, of works that you are presenting. So when you're looking at your schedule, and, and please, uh, uh, you know, everybody should just jump in at this point. When you're looking at your schedule, when you're planning that out, could you each just describe how you look at that? Because there is a mix from behind the scenes of the things that you can pre-plan, and then there are opportunistic elements that sort of come in during the year. Um, there are gaps in the schedule that you have to fill. There are unforeseen events. Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about how you act, how you bring together a, a, a year or a season. Uh, Terry, you want to you want to just uh, give because. And also different venues with different, it has different elements, right? Sure. Well, we, we have a number of venues also, none is none nearly as large as Allen's. And so there is an element of finding the right kind of artist or community activity to go into each of those spaces. But we're also thinking about how do we want the whole community to view the Clarice? So we're trying to come up with a mix of the season that will enhance the overall brand, not just the brand of singular series. And then so well, that's that's sort of the overriding factor in structuring a season. And then we try to fit great artists and great community events in the various venues we have, both on campus and off. I so wish I had, I wish I had a, a, a venue like Steelhouse Omaha. That would be an enormous, <laughs> uh, an enormous uh, resource to everything we're trying to do. So, so when you all see a season unfold, right, you, you you started to schedule and then you sort of look at this and you're thinking, hmm, we've served people who are this kind of taste, this kind of background, this type of ethnicity, this, this type of age group, you're looking at the people who you haven't served yet in a year, right? As, as that year unfolds, you're always looking at the gaps in your services to your communities. Is that, is that correct, John, or, is, or am I getting that wrong? Well, it, it's it's a complicated mix, I think. So, yes, um, we do look at, first of all, what the community is already offering so that we are not replicating some of that. So, for instance, we have with our mission, we have a, a big commitment to jazz and to dance and to um, some of the artists, art forms that are not maybe as well represented. We also look at opportunities um, where the we present touring Broadway. Um, but what else can we bring in? And then with our commitment to our DEI work, we also want to make sure that our artists are representative of, of that commitment and the opportunities for engagement and education. So it really, there's short-term and long-term programming decisions, but we are continuing to evolve all the time. Um, you know, Broadway shows may be booked a couple years out and we've got a touring band that's coming through in three months. So, or a comedian. So it really, it, it really is a, a wide mix of decisions to make sure we're here, we're here for a lot of audiences. And there were embedded, embedded assumptions that, that um, it, whether there was real segregation in terms of, of facility serving uh, one group or another group, or whether it was just assumed within society, there were there were assumptions of, of what would go on what stage. Uh, Alan, right now we're trying to eliminate those assumptions and just look at a, look at these venues afresh and bring in these different audiences. How how are you approaching this in Atlanta? Because you've got a a real history of of, of transformation, and Atlanta is is part of the center of it. Will probably be. Um, into the future, how, how are you looking at, at that transformative process and how does that affect your decisions on staff, on your programmers, um, on the artists that you that you invite into your venue? Sure. I mean, we're the home of the civil rights movement, you know, here in Atlanta. So we're always very cognizant of that. Um, so it, it does start with the staff and, and who we have and uh, and trying to groom uh, different individuals from a variety of demographics uh, in this industry um, and to uh, grow within this industry. So we're proud to participate in that. Uh, we've tried really, we've been working, frankly, for the last five years to do more Latin programming uh, because our Latin community is growing leaps and bounds in, in the Atlanta area. And we kind of looked at ourselves in the mirror and we realized we weren't really doing enough of that programming. But obviously, again, given our size, it was a bit of our handicap in terms of finding the right artists. And as artists were uh, becoming more and more popular um, in, in Latin pop music, we were able to start uh, bringing some of them in and uh, getting more involved 
involved not only on the grassroots side with the Latin uh, Chamber of Commerce here uh, in Atlanta or uh, bringing those artists into play our venue. So we felt like we had a pretty good cross section of the community based on all of our programming, but we knew that we were missing something there. So we're at least conscious of that. And we, we try to examine uh, our overall programming, both short term and long term, as Joan said, and figure out where the gaps are. Yeah, and I, I would say, I, I want to add two more, but the focus on, we were talking about venues for a moment. Steelhouse, while it's, it is really being designed as a flat open space for some of the touring bands that where you can stand and listen, it's a flexible space so that an opera could do a thrust stage or a symphony could be in the round or dancers could do creative immersive experience. So it's also for community to be able to create this next wave of artistic opportunity. So it's not just commercial. It's something that we're developing so that we have a different type of space for the artists to connect to community. So it, it really provides lots of opportunity. Do you interact with uh, now Terry's got kind of the, the, the ready-made sort of educational relationship with the university and, and universities have their own challenges. And we're going to, we're going to have Terry speak uh, on that in a, in a second. But Joan, do you, Alan, do you also interact with partners um, within the community, educational partners, universities, and so on, in, in a way that that affects your programming? I'm not just talking about the artists and and so on, but but partners where it what they're doing affects you, and and you're in kind of a bi-directional um, uh, dialogue, Joan. We, we do. Uh, in fact, a couple of years ago, we, we developed the Voices Amplified series, which is our arts and social justice series. Um, it was it developed at the time in response to the George Floyd murder, but it's gone on to include partners across the community and non-traditional partners, such as No More Empty Pots, which um, takes an opportunity to uh, people who are food insecure or film streams or um, culture house. We've been working in hip hop. We've been working with um, a fashion institute, lots of different types of partners that are seen as non-traditional, but we have a way to connect to the art form. So it, it's it's really developed, I think, some wonderful relationships and new audiences uh, have followed. And Alan, do you have those kinds of relationships? We have different well. kinds of relationships. Actually, we um, in our education side, we we uh, being a home of civil rights, we have Fox in the Box, uh, and we take the Fox to schools uh, throughout uh, throughout the state. And we're trying to visit all counties in the state where we um, teach some of the lessons in the Georgia curriculum, as well as lessons about preservation and the history of the Fox Theater. And we kind of inter we have it interwoven with the civil rights movement. Um, and then in addition to that, we have what we call Fox Theater Institute. So again, because we're born out of preservation, we help other historic theaters around the state um, uh, get on their feet. So we do everything from uh, operating and managing Georgia Presenters, which is a booking consortium to help program their buildings. We provide grants to those theaters for artists. Um, and then we also provide bricks and mortar grants, study grants, emergency grants um, to those theaters uh, in all those communities throughout rural Georgia. So we've given away several million dollars. Uh, so we're actually a nonprofit that also gives away money. Um, and we help other nonprofits throughout the state. And we've even ventured out into South Carolina and Alabama and others when some theaters were damaged by hurricanes and, and such. So um, we, again, kind of move in a slightly different direction centered around preservation and history. That's that's just so superb. Um, Terry, you've got a whole other uh, set of challenges, right? Because you have a whole university community. You have an audience. You You serve as a gateway between the university and the community. And, and you mentioned that as part of your, your, um, your mission is to deal with topics that intersect with justice in other areas. Could you talk about how that affects your programming now that you're within a university environment, you run major performing arts centers. How is that different for you? Well, it's, uh, it's uh, at the University of Maryland, it is welcomed with enthusiasm. And that, is, that has not always been the case. Uh, but the the university recognizes that as a flagship organization, there is still a disconnect between the university and the community. So they are anxious to build bridges and 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 to engage the community in a in a very broad and comprehensive way. So anything that we do at the Clarice to help them push in that direction is uh, is welcomed. They also uh, the president is 
is uh, President Pines at the university is fantastic because he believes the the arts and and interse- the arts and how they intersect with technology should be used to address the grand issues of the time. So that has really opened the door for us to be quite culturally active, as I mentioned. And we have programs that will be you know anti racism, but also anti gun violence and preservation of women's rights and LGBTQ rights. So it's a uh, all of these initiatives and digital crease, they're all treated equally and with the same intentionality as our artistic programming. So this mix of programming streams is defining, uh, defining the future of the crease. And we're in a welcoming environment for that. Thank, thank goodness. So this is interesting. So arts can sometimes be accused by people with a particular political agenda as be, being political, either conservative or, or liberal or progressive or whatever, whatever stripe you're, you're talking about. But are you talking about taking um, a predictable um, position each and every time? Or are you talking about basically giving voice to the, the discussions that are going on in society? In other words, you might have a play that takes on a particular um, uh, stance that would be viewed by politicians as being very liberal one night and very conservative another night, a different a different play. Are you thinking in terms of just sort of giving voice to all these different ways of thinking about about the reality of America? Well, I think in our programming, we do represent an eclectic range of points of view. But in this uh, um, uh, cultural activism stream of our programming, I think it'll be a very clear point of view that we will be taking. And this is, you know, we, we feel here at the Clarice anyway, that it's we need to be strong cultural citizens and, and, and take positions and act on those positions so that we can contribute to hopefully a you know, more civil society looking into the future. We don't want to take any chance that we're in any way just sitting on the sidelines waiting to see how that all turns out. You know, we're institutional citizens and we want to be part of the future of the community, just, just like we all do. And everybody, everybody evolves in different ways. Now, there's, a, there's an aspect of that that is uh, so engaging and so entertaining, right? It, it makes people think you can actually be entertained, right, Terry? Sure. And Joan, how do you look at that that balance between, um, you know, or or Alan, uh, please jump in. You know, you have comedians who have a point of view. You have comedians who um, who j- just are trying for, for for the surprise and the joke. Right. Um, how do you how do you deal with that so that you're serving these different audiences with these these different viewpoints, but also not becoming flat and just simply rehashing the thing that is. It's, it's the compromise that everybody thinks is okay. How do, how do you deal with, with, with that in your programming, uh, Alan and Joan? Well, we take kind of a neutral stance, as, frankly. Right? We feel like we're a vessel for people to speak and speak their mind. Um, and, and obviously there's a lot of different viewpoints. And uh, I try to explain to our staff and to our artists that it, everyone buys tickets, right? If you're on the left or you're on the right. And, and I think uh, we can be a, a platform for all. And we believe that we're everybody's theater. So um, however they wish to express themselves, they're welcome to do so. Uh, but we're careful about not taking a specific position unless it impacts the theater or the arts community uh, here in Atlanta, so we don't want to um, we don't want to prevent any audience from feeling comfortable and coming to the Fox, um, and we'd like everyone to visit and feel comfortable uh, speaking uh, about what they believe in and what their truths are and and how they feel society should evolve. So you feel like it's it's part of just being a town square. A town square is open to everybody. Everybody should be able to speak their mind. Everybody should be able to um, to enjoy sort of the community together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and sometimes it's challenging, especially during election cycles. Um, and, you know, we've had uh, we, we've we've hosted uh, Hillary Clinton. We've hosted Donald Trump. We've hosted uh, many, many people. And, and occasionally you get some backlash for that. Right. Um, and, but we we allow all to come and to utilize the facility uh, whenever possible and um, and express their viewpoint. Joan, how do you see it from from the center of America's heartland? <laughs> we are, um, I think, similar to Alan. We we certainly um, host a wide variety um, of opinions in our buildings. Um, we're very clear, though, that um, we, Omaha Performing Arts, have a commitment to our core values, 
which includes a commitment to our idea work, um, inclusion, um, but we, those all those core values also include freedom of expression, so that we are open to uh, opinions that not everybody may agree with. Um, and I don't know anyone who can control what a comedian says. So um, <laughs> when, when we book them, so um, we we certainly have a wide array. Uh, but we make sure that the programs we do control um, demonstrate the core commitment um, uh, of our idea values. Well, I think just sitting next to somebody who's laughing at the same thing in real time, it's a live performance. You can't do a redo. We can't just go into our little corners, even even going to the bar and having a drink or, or you know, standing in line with somebody. Right. It's a way to interact with people who you don't. I mean, you're you're going to be sitting next to a random person, right? Those kinds of things are are all uh, really really important. Uh, Joan, how do you see the the uh, the fact that we're moving from a pandemic to an endemic stage on this COVID situation, which has hurt all performing arts venues? Do you feel like um, you're you're well equipped to continue operating, uh, regardless to what happens uh, during the winter months, when it's very likely that we're going to uh, have uh, some issues with with uh, COVID spread, but we seem to be hopefully at a point where we can treat uh, a lot of these cases, uh, we can get immunized and so on. Will that affect you going forward? Do you think, what does your planning show you? Sure. Um, we were um, have continued to make sure we did all the COVID uh, protocols for our buildings and all of the facility needs that we have. Um, we are, I want to say, if it's fortunate or just luck that we were in a part of the country that wasn't quite as closed down as I think some of the coasts. And we were able to open really on the very early side. We were one of the first um, organizations to, to really resume full operations. So our audiences are accustomed to being back. We've had very robust ticket sales. Last year was a terrific season and we're seeing the same thing. Um, some of the traditional art forms right now are a little slower to come back. Um, and I think we're seeing that across the country. But Primarily here in the Midwest, people have resumed their attendance, particularly here for commercial, for Broadway, um, and some of the comedians and speakers. And we're, we, we have not taken, I think, some of the uh, decline that we've seen elsewhere of people being reticent to, to come to the theater. Um, uh, Terry, Alan, what are you uh, what are you saying? Are you are you pretty much set going forward, do you feel or are you also hedging a little bit um, in terms of your your operations going into the next uh, part of the season? We're going full steam ahead. So, uh, you know, we're hopeful that we won't have a major shutdown. I don't think our state was as aggressive as Omaha, uh, but I think we're somewhere second or third in line after that, um, thanks to our governor. So, um, and we we helped the other venues uh, figure out how to open up and and uh, and created a reopening guide for the state uh, along with some of our partners in the area. So um, we're, we're sit poised You're to sad. continue. Full speed ahead. Terry, are you full speed ahead? I'd say we're full speed ahead. And I think each in our own way, we're we're trying to continue and strengthen our programming in ways that are aligned with our values, as Joan mentioned. And the better job we do with that, the that we'll build these relationships with the community that will help us weather whatever comes our way. So I think we've all evolved and become sensitized to the various issues that will help us moving forward, but we're definitely full speed ahead. So staying with you, Terry, and then we'll go to Alan, and then we're going to give Joan the last word uh, before Yay. we wrap up. Um, but but I'd like to talk about how we can encourage art and the creation of new art, encourage artists. Artists have really had a very difficult time during this the, 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 these uh, several years. Um, how do we do that? How do we make sure that we still have the joy of of music and theatrical performance and creation, sort of originality, filmmaking. Um, um, Alan, you were mentioning that you present films. How do we ensure that vitality, Terry, um, as performing arts uh, presenters, that we're that we're we're helping people who are creation creating, and maybe the first creation isn't as scintillating as the next creation, or maybe you luck out as an audience and you just see something that is phenomenal the first time. Right. Uh, tell me, how, how do we, how do we help? Well, there's, there's a lot of different ways, but one of the most basic ways is whatever we're doing to strengthen the sustainability of our own organizations 
helps us continue to plot, um, provide employment and supportive programs to artists that are out in the field working. I think uh, uh, commission programs, of course, we, we have a, a program where we're developing additional resources for independent artists that might help them better navigate the post pandemic world, whether they're coming to us or not. And uh, I, I would just say at the, at the Clarice, we're, we're broadening the, ray, the, the array of ways in which we engage artists and how they engage issues in society. And that, uh, that provides more opportunities for employment and, and commissioning and compensation. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky balance to strike, but you just have to do everything you can. Yeah, in, 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 in a real way, you're, you're trying to direct income streams to support an ecosystem and maintaining your own balance as well. So you're trying to basically strengthen everyone um, by being at the intersection of where audiences are paying tickets. You actually can affect the entire sector. Alan, how, how are you approaching this? You know, uh, probably Terry and Joan are better equipped given that they have smaller venues in which to help develop art forms and artists. You know, we do it, as I mentioned earlier, through the Fox Theater Institute by providing grants for programming. So those smaller venues can take a chance on some of those artists and hopefully uh, help them uh, tour the state and, and develop their art form, which hopefully will eventually grow into an audience that was worthy of the Fox's size. So that's how we participate. Well, let's not forget your educational programming, right? The next artist might be somebody who got their start. And I'm really serious about this, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you create art and it, it leaves an indelible, everybody remember their first, their first paintings when they were kids? I do, right? Sure. It's 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 something or, or when you were in the school play, Joan, how do, how do you uh, uh, help the artists in your ecosystem? Um, I, a couple of ways we've developed the artists here. First of all, certainly are bringing in the touring artists. But sometimes with those, we will hire local bands or local groups to perform um, an opener so that we give local artists an opportunity we also hire a lot of teaching artists for our education programs. Um, we're partnering um, with the Broadway League, with uh, the National High School or the Nebraska High School Theater Academy here across the state. Um, we've got we're working with Disney, we're working with Carnegie Hall, and we're hiring the teaching artists to help develop the next generation. So um, it is it all stems from what we put on our stages and the partnerships in the community. So um, everything we do is really to support the art and to, to make sure we've got a vibrant artistic community um, to, to reach the audiences. So I think that's what all of us are doing and uh, certainly have a tremendous commitment to that. And we as audience members, how do we help? We can be curious. We can attend. We can buy tickets. We can Show come up. to the venues. <laughs> right? Show up. Show up. Show up. Show up. <laughs> Terry Dwyer, Executive Director of the Clarice Smith Performing Arts Center at the University of Maryland. Joan Squire, President of Omaha Performing Arts. And Alan Vela, uh, President and CEO of the Fox Theater in Atlanta. Thank you so much for helping us to understand your daily work the work of your staffs, your boards, thank your, thank your funders, thank your audiences, and most of all, thank your artists and those who support them. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thanks, Mark.